Hello, BookTube. What's well, the first mail haul of the week? So I thought we'd uh, take a look <laughs> and see what kinds of treasures we might have. I've been accumulating books all day, rather industriously, so the ramparts already exist, even without any mail actually coming here. <laughs> so, uh, so this could be a busy week. We shall see. Uh, let's see what this first one is. Oh, okay, great. I, we saw this. Uh, we saw this when I looked at the W.W. Norton catalog. This comes out in October, and this is after Emily. All The story of uh, the two women who ensured the literary legacy of Emily Dickinson, uh, which was uh, has often been described inaccurately as something that Emily Dickinson herself cared very little about. But these two women had conflicting ideas, and apparently this is... There's quite a bit of melodrama. I encountered a bit of that melodrama in an Emily Dickinson biography that I read, uh, but I've never read a whole book on it. So this is that's fantastic. Uh, that's great. Glad to have it. Glad to see the uh, the Norton catalog starting to show up. Uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, this is uh, what is this? I don't really know. Uh, this is, oh, it's a collection of essays by Robert Gottlieb, Near-Death Experiences and Others. Uh, this is uh, a new collection of immersive essays from the most acclaimed editor of the second half of the 20th century, um, who wrote Avid Reader. He wrote a memoir called Avid Reader that I reviewed. Uh, this new collection from the legendary editor Robert Gottlieb features 20 or so pieces he's written mostly for the New York Review of Books ranging from reconsiderations of American writers such as Dorothy Parker, Thornton Wilder, Thomas Wolfe, James Jones, to Leonard Bernstein, Lawrence Hart, and Lady Diana Cooper. Okay, so this is just deadline prose of a high order. Great. Uh, I'm sure that I have read all of these pieces. I've never, I don't think I've ever missed a piece by him, but it's great to have them in a book. That's wonderful. All right, so uh, let's, see, let's see what this next one is. Huh. Okay, I think we saw this already. This is from 7th Street Books, a great publisher of uh, murder mysteries. This comes out on the 1st of May, and it is La it's by Larry Sweezy, and it's called See Also Proof. Kind of evocative cover there. Uh, Dickinson, North Dakota, 1965. It's a harsh winter, and freelance indexer Marjorie Trumaine struggles to complete a lengthy index while mourning the recent loss of her husband, Hank. The bleakness of the weather seems to compound her grief, and then she gets more bad news. A neighbor's 14-year-old disabled daughter has disappeared. Marjorie joins Sheriff Guy Reinhardt in the search for the missing girl, and their investigation quickly leads to the shocking discovery of a murdered man near the girl's family's home. Okay. All right, great. So this is uh, its certainly going to be in an atmosphere that I... I uh, I know North Dakota quite well, and I have actually been in North Dakota in the middle of winter, when which are, it, its winters are legendary. Uh, and it, this is another example of something of a trend that I've seen in murder mysteries uh, to avoid the 21st century, to avoid the internet, uh, to avoid the instantaneous uh, availability of all knowledge by setting murder mysteries anywhere but the present day. I, I've, I've noticed that uh, in a whole bunch of... Um, of new and old series. I don't so much mind. I just I just wonder if it's a tacit acknowledgement on some murder mystery part, the writer parts, that uh, a murder mystery in the 21st century is really hard to do, maybe prohibitively hard to do. I'm wondering, do you, any of you, a lot of you are bigger mystery fans than I am, do you know of a murder mystery series that actually put a spotlight on the detection, on the solving of the crime, not so much uh, paranormal or anything like that, that take place full in the full light of the present day. Do you do you know an ongoing murder mystery series like that, uh, where the where the main character has to know how to Google, and stuff like that? Uh, I'd be curious to know if there's a series like that out there that's doing it well that I'm missing. Uh, now let's move on. To this next one. I don't know if I mentioned this. This uh, mail hall ends not only in one enormous box, but in two enormous boxes. Uh, uh, oh, great. Okay, fantastic. Wonderful. This is a May release as well, I think. No, no, this is October. Oh, good Lord. This is a long time from now. Uh, this is James Jamie Susskind's Future Politics. Uh, 
which sounded really intriguing to me. Uh, here, let me let me see if I can get the. Uh, Jamie Susskind, I believe, is a baby. I think he's like in his twenties or his thirties, something like that. He's an author, speaker, practicing barrister. Oh, maybe he's not young then. A past fellow of Harvard University's Berkman Center for the Internet and Society. He studied history and politics at Oxford, and he lives in London. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right, so he's got those impressive credentials, but he's also got product in his hair. So he might be really young. I'll have to Google him and find out. Uh, it's, it's the book that intrigued me, though. Uh, rapid and relentless technological innovation will transform the way we live together. The generation now approaching political maturity will need to grapple with how and to what extent their lives should be directed and controlled by powerful digital systems. That question lies at the heart of future politics. This hypothetical is swiftly becoming a reality as more and more evidence points toward the manipulation of technology to skew the U.S. 2016 presidential election and the Brexit movement in the U.K. With exponential advances in artificial intelligence, virtual reality, big data collection and storage and other fields, the influence and pervasiveness of technology in our lives will only continue to grow. To cope with these new challenges, we need a radical upgrade in our political ideas. Hmm. Okay. Fantastic. All right, so that comes out in the fall. I might want to read this well before then, though. That sounds fascinating. Uh, okay, now we'll, we'll deal with the, uh, with the first of the big boxes. Two big boxes here. Can't really imagine what these could be. Um, I, I think I have a fairly good handle on them. Huge new books that are coming out. And I, I, let's see, let's see what the first one is. Oh, oh boy, okay. All right, oh, this is even prettier than I thought. Good Lord. Okay, this comes out in mid-May. We've already seen this. I think I squeed about it when I got the advanced copy, but the finished copy is just beautiful. Oh, my God. Oh, okay, this is, oh, and it's fully illustrated, too. This is an ancient text. This is Diogenes Laertius's Lives of the Eminent Philosophers. In a new translation by Pamela Mensch, look at how lovely that is. Good Lord. Uh, just embossed letters on the spine, embossed letters on the front. Oh, my. Oh, my. Okay. Okay, this was uh, first compiled in the 3rd century, came to prominence in Renaissance Italy. To this day, it remains a crucial source of much of what we know about the origins and practice of philosophy in ancient Greece, covering a longer period of time and a larger number of figures, from Pythagoras to Socrates to Aristotle to Epicurus, than any other ancient source. And this is a new edition, a new translation, new annotations, new everything. This is a beautiful edition. Oh, how lovely. Oh, my. The lives of the eminent philosophers. No, you no longer need to go and dig up the old Rome hardcover classic with a wooden translation. Instead, you've got a, just a lavish labor of love. Good Lord. Oh, illustrations all throughout. Amazing. Okay. All right. All right. It's going to be tough for the second box to top that one. That's incredible. I completely forgot that I only had the advanced copy. Uh, let's, see. let's see what this next one is. Oh, no! <laughs> oh, goodness gracious! It's a, it's a second copy. It's a second copy of the finished copy of Lives of the Eminent Philosophers. Oh, my! Oh, goodness. <laughs> okay. Oh, Oh, boy. All right. Uh, okay, well. So there we have it. Good Lord. So we have, I've got two finished copies of The Lives of the Eminent Philosophers. Uh, and then we move on to Jamie Susskind's Future Politics. Uh, after Emily, which is about Emily Dickinson's literary legacy. Uh, see also Proof, a murder mystery set in uh, pre-internet North Dakota. And Near-Death Experiences, a collection of the occasional pieces of Robert Gottlieb, which is great in its own right. Uh, so that's wonderful. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is our first mail haul of the week, and we'll see what the rest of the week brings. <laughs> Thank you, Book 2.